there's a party starting at 10 for the festival, and I'm going to play the address at the end. But um, hi, everybody. I'm Kristen Marty, and I'm your executive director here and the co director of the Prototype Festival. And you guys just saw the work of these three interesting artists who are all working in really different ways. And I'm trying to find a thematic connection to have a discussion with the group of you. Um, so, I mean, one thing, just an obvious thing to talk about is that a lot of you have careers as individual artists, and you've made this choice to work in a company context, in an ensemble context, and maybe you could talk a little bit about what brought you to that place uh, as a creator to think that way. I can, I did this the other day, so I can answer. I started writing plays for, as a frustrated performer to perform in, and then I, um, I did a bunch of writing for, um, like on commission for a company or other people, and it was great. And then I started to realize that I was um, like not liable because the play would, is usually only half written. And then there's all these quite unanswered questions. And I was like expecting these people, other people to answer those questions when really it was like they were still writer questions. And so I, I um, decided at the urging of two or three people that I trusted, other artists who were very close to me that kept saying, you have to, you're gonna have to start your own company. It was the last thing that I wanted to do or felt like doing. But then as soon as I did, I felt like it is, it's the right thing. Yeah, um, company, I guess, I guess the company formed out, for me, formed out of necessity. I'm, I'm better when I'm working with other people and I, I like, I always say I like to be the dumbest person in the room because I think I'm, I'm pretty good at what I do. So if everybody else is like way better, then the work will be way better. And it's true. And I, and like the, the, the better I get at it, the less I want to have to do with everything. Like the more I want to get really amazing people, um, from original company members like Abigail Browdy to, <laughs> to, to hey. <laughs> um, but no, but it's like if you surround yourself with amazing people, your work is way, way better. So why would I have only my ideas when I could have the amazing ideas and abilities of like ten people in the room? Oh, I was just gonna say that we three as new women disagree a lot. So <laughs> when we do agree on something, that makes it more valuable. Right, if it passes, if it, if it like passes all three thresholds of our standards, then we know it's an okay idea. Or it, it's not just okay, it's like fine. <laughs> <laughs> Passable. Um, so there was a lot of different representations of gender tonight, and talk about that in some of the pieces, and also representation of gender and the way that your people were moving. Do you guys want to talk a little bit about your thinking about that? Maybe you guys would start off with some. Sure. Um, oh, I think we were thinking of uh, the musical My Fair Lady, and obviously it's uh, deeply problematic. And but uh, we love it. It's so fun. It's great. Um, and then you, we were remembering watching it as little girls, and then we rewatched it, and we're like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> it was especially sad because Rex Harrison was like so sexy to me when I was a kid. I like really thought he was, he played Henry Higgins. And then you go back and you watch and it's like he's such a misogynist, he's such a jerk. Um, so it, that was hard to grapple with. And then I think ultimately, like this, the song is in the musical, it's sung by a man, but it's just sort of like more fun. It's a more fun song. So that's why we chose to do it. Does that feel right? It's a beautiful song. <laughs> <laughs> we had long convos about our own personal gender identities and then didn't find a way to um, use much of that. And it became more about the musical than our personal experiences. Yeah. yeah, but I think we are just at the beginning of trying to think about gender and how we represent it. it and how like, that has to do with appearance and language, which all might sound really obvious. <laughs> yes, it does, but that's, that's what we're thinking about. You want, can you answer? About, about gender. I don't have a good answer right now. You don't? No, no, I mean, there's a couple things. I mean, I think the way we generate movement is, and like the, the physical vocabulary is everybody's 
shaking stuff, and then it gets put on all these different bodies. So you already have a uh, like there's a, there's already like stuff's already spliced from the very beginning. Um, that's one way. I don't know. It's it's a it's a long involved question that I could babble about for a long time. But I think that's the answer I want to give now in terms of what we looked at tonight. Yeah. Did I did I do Jen? Was my we Mothering and sons and yeah. elder women <laughs> and the disrespect of our elders and yeah 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 I mean the women particularly it wasn't all elders it was elder women particularly okay okay I'm yes good. no that is true that is true I didn't realize I was thinking about that so specifically but I have been a lot and um, life stages that we don't do a lot of life stage honoring in our culture and so I'm trying to do some of that in, in the rituals that we're doing to sort of bring it back and so that we um, look at ourselves in our different groups and all that we offer and um, the various roles that we play um, and uh, honoring that especially especially with the elders I feel like it's so we don't we really rarely do that enough and um, and with all all genders and um, anyway that's in the project in the larger project but I guess in this monologue yeah there's it just was based on one story of something that happened when I was a kid but then um, thinking about all of you because it was a ceramics class with all of these older women and it was great I loved going and I learned so much from them it wasn't all bad stuff and that I'm so glad that my mother took me to that because they were really, really great. And um, I don't know, I just feel really lucky to have had that experience, I guess. But um, I guess just writing about it from personal, from personal uh, perspective. Yeah. It's nice to hear something that um, is talking about elders. It's actually not talked about very much. Yeah. Um, they're like the most silenced group of people. Yeah, I and they're the ones with all the wisdom. And they have all this experience that is not brought into the conversation a lot. Especially so, older so. women. Yeah. 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 I mean, they really know so much, and we don't, I don't know, we don't, it's, it's, there's a channel of communication. I don't know how to open it, because there are all, all these difficulties also. Mm -hmm. Because maybe, because our world is changing so quickly that by the time you get to, like, your mother's generation and the generation before that, there's so much of a, di like, the world is completely different. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and, and our, um, our um, uh, tradition, there's no tradition anymore. Or they're very flimsy. If they are, and like commercialized now. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it's it's hard. I feel like maybe the traditions and the rituals of a traditional culture is what like it gets handed down. You have more of a consciousness of who came before and who comes in the generation after. We don't really have that so much mm -hmm. anymore. And there's all these difficulties because well, look at she's dressed like a slut, you know. And we're because our generation is different. All the generations do all this changing. And it's not like when you grow up, then you do this, and you do, you know, you move in through these. So we don't, there's all this stuff getting in the way of our connection with other generations, probably. Interesting. I guess. Um, what are the, when you start making a work, um, is, what's the creative spark, like, for this piece? What was the thing that got you started? Was it that particular recording, that album recording? Yeah, this one was um, my friend Javi, who's a DJ, who's actually supplying a bunch of the music for this this piece. Uh, we were at a party at his house in the Catskills at about three in the morning, and he put on this loon record. It's this Audubon Society recording of, of loon sounds and this guy talking about them, and it's the most, oh, wow. especially if you're on mushrooms, it's the most incredible uh, recording, and he would put different music underneath it, um, and we're like, oh my god, play it again. And I just became obsessed with it. And then I began using it when I was teaching, and I would have people uh, improvise to it. And I was like, there's something, there's something to this that's capturing a lot. And then thinking about like watching humans interact with this. And actually, none of the text Rob was doing was from that recording. That's all yeah. stuff Rob wrote. But the recording comes in later in the, in the piece. And it just it sort of blew out and became about so many things. So I've been teaching with it for about a year and just getting more and more obsessed with it and, just, and thought like this has to turn into a thing. Rob, would you talk about how you came to develop the rituals? 
Yeah, I mean, we developed everything separately because I was abroad for the past two months and Dan was here. And uh, we started with this, this loon text. And then it kind of followed my own train of thought as I was sitting there writing for two months and became much more personal into like me kind of exploring these scientific ideas and then it goes into more personal things about memory that, that I'm dealing with at the moment. And, and I think for me it was, uh, I wanted to make something more personal. I think Dan and I both wanted to make something more personal after, you know, I've, I've done a bunch of stuff, but I haven't done something so personal in a while. I mean, one of the things I, I worked on in Lithuania had a little bit of this personal thing in it, but, uh, but this is going further in that direction. Yeah. This talking more about passage of time? And yeah, that, passage yeah. of time. I mean, I think it's like things I'm thinking about now, you know, and as I get older and I'm past this stage, you know, I was in this company for 10 years and I'm in this kind of period after that. So it's, it's a lot of reflection and, uh, and thought and, and wanting to move forward in a different way too. So it's like, can I take those thoughts that I'm having and somehow put them on stage where it means something to other people? <laughs> and I, I don't know if it does, but I, I always feel like if you say something that in the moment means something very strongly to you, then it does come across to other people. Yeah, I mean, I think memory perhaps is the thing that the, the three pieces the most yeah, tonight in terms of what you were talking about. Yeah, because Sybil was also talking about this. And then you guys talking about My Fair Lady. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Which is kind of a bad thing, nostalgia. <laughs> it's like good and bad. Unpack that. Yeah. But, but, the, and the, but it, it, can, it can lead to such terrible things, nostalgia. Sure. Yeah. yeah. This one also. Yeah, this one. This one also. We've been with Witness Relocation we, the last like, seven years. Um, most of the shows we've done have been uh, written by Chuck Me. And before that, we were always making, we were always like going from zero in the room. And this is the first time we've really gone from there's just like an idea, mm -hmm. um, and it feels really uncomfortably personal. And which was, was always my barometer. I was like, if I if I'm nervous for people to see this and they're going to learn something about me that I don't want the public to know, I'm like, okay, this is working. Mm -hmm. um, and this finally again really feel, I'm just like, ooh, you're really letting people in on some shit. And that's and like that's exciting. And that's the so yeah, that was also I think the driving force behind it was, and both of us agreed on that was like. And I think also as an artist, you, you always have to constantly re-examine why you're doing this thing. Mm -hmm. Because there's so many things that will tell you it's, it's not worth it. Mm -hmm. So uh, a part of it, I guess, is this re-examination. How do I find again what it means to, to do this stuff? Mm -hmm. And why do we do it? And why? <laughs> why? <laughs> like, what <laughs> good does it do? Like, right. who's getting something? Yeah, to, so Maddie mentioned watching the movie I see again, Girl, which I did as well with my mom, and then rewatched it recently, and was like sort of horrified because you know it's like it's a Pygmalion myth, but it's also the Cinderella like rags to riches story, and the man is like you're trash, but if I clean you up and make you look good and sound good, then you can be a princess. But really, you're still trash, and I can do whatever I want with you. And so I've just been thinking a lot about like how how deeply seated the rags to riches myth is in me and like how it affects me, how I think about myself as a woman or this idea that like someday I'll have money, which like probably is not true. Um, and like, and like this like kind of someday myth. Um, and also we've been really interested in like, uh, I've been working on a musical as like my day job. So like the musical form and my fair lady is a movie musical, and there's actually that intermission in the movie, which is amazing because you have to hear the, the intermission music. Um, and so we were kind of interested in like, you know, a play that became a musical that became a movie musical, like back to a play, but maybe it's just with three people. And like musicals are all about making money, it seems, or they do that really well. Um, and so that's like kind of where this like commerce element came in, selling the candy and counting the money while the like showy thing is happening. And and there's something of of um in Pygmalion and in, in My Fair Lady Eliza at the end says to Henry Higgins, she's uh, she's like, you have made me so that the only thing that I can say 
sell now. Just like you said that if I could talk like a lady, I could work in a flower shop, but now I'm too high class to work in a flower shop, so now the only thing I can sell is myself. He's like, you can marry well. And she's like, you can turn me into a prostitute. Which is, um, yeah, so I think that was the sort of commoditization of, of the human, the female body. Objectify something else that nobody women are objectified. Um, and also, I think also sort of like thinking of, of your question also about how it started, how the process started, was like prior to this, we've been working for about three years on a, on a Chekhov adaptation, and that feels so um, uh, like feelings and emotions and people stewing and, and text and a musical is not that, um, and I think it was sort of, like it, it, it felt like um, sort of a palate cleanser to try and do that. My you seem like you want to say um, Also, I think uh, thinking about aspirational, you already spoke of this, aspirationalism and performance of self and the language you use and that, that your performance of self is um, money or is, uh, or working in a restaurant and then going to restaurants, using language in some circumstances and then others. Um, that. Yeah, but it's a That was another. Matt, do you want to say anything? No, not particularly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just the robot designer. <laughs> oh, good. starts at 10 at the Liberty at 29 West 35th, just one short block from here. So thanks everyone, enjoy whatever else. <laughs>